Well, good evening and welcome back to another episode of Words with Friends. And you notice my friend has changed. It's not Luke this week. My good friend Jim McDaniel is here with me. Uh, Luke is on vacation and Leah is on maternity leave. And so I'm super excited to have a conversation with you, Jim. We usually do this for our prayer time. Yes. But tonight we get to do what you and I like to do, which is to talk about the Lord and to talk about the Word. And uh, we, you know, we we may go on for an hour, <laughs> but we'll only show about 20 minutes of this. And uh, tonight we're continuing that series in the what we call the Shema series, uh, looking at that that great passage. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. Um, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, it, the the beginning of the video every week says, every morning, the Hebrew mm. people say this prayer. What are some things? What are some habits that you have, and, and maybe you used them for a season, for a time, and they were meaningful to you. And now, in a in a different season, you have different habits. But what are some of those things for for you as a as a seasoned Christian? <laughs> what are what are some of those things that you said? Yeah, I go back to this. I go back to this habit. I go back to this tradition, if I can say tradition. What what is that for you? I like your word season. Yes. <laughs> uh, something that I've been doing for several years now is to try very early in the morning, if not the first thing, then certainly uh, soon thereafter to read two chapters, uh, one from the Psalms and one from the New Testament. Uh, I, um, I've been a part of those read the Bible through in yes. a year programs, and I've always been frustrated by them. Now, I, I think that everyone ought to, right? at least once. <laughs> We're not against it. But for and, me, it always brings up a sense of have to. It becomes uh, laborious. It becomes... Another one of those things that I have to catch up on. Right. It's an assignment. Yes. And yes. I don't pay attention to what I'm doing. And limiting it to a New Testament passage and a psalm. Yes. Then I can concentrate, slow down, read, think about it. And I find that my day goes a whole lot better when I, early in the morning, if not the very first thing, then certainly within the first hour, uh, read those two chapters. I've, I've gotten into a new habit um, Whenever anyone comes to mind, when I think of somebody and I think, oh, I should write them a note or I want to remember to pray for them, uh, especially people going through long-term illnesses and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And so I've gotten into this habit of just picking up my phone and texting that person. Oh, great. And I'll say, I was praying this morning and you came up. Um, and I found that that habit of not waiting... Because I'll, I'll think, oh, I should really write them a card. Well, who takes the time or can remember? And then it would really, I would really hate this to happen. I would think about somebody. I'd be praying for them. And then I would see them. And they'd say, oh, have you been praying for me? And I thought, oh, I just wish I had said that. You know, I wish I had told them. But there's, there's something about the habit of encouragement. Yes. Of saying, I, I just appreciate you. I'm thankful for you. Um, I did this yesterday to a friend who's a preacher, and their church has just, he's preached more funerals in the last year than anybody should. Mm-hmm. You remember those days. Yes. And I sent him a text, told him what I you know was thinking about him, and you could tell he said, he, he wrote back, he said, thank you. Is there a reason why you're sitting with this? Like he thought, you know, did, is it out there that I'm super depressed or something? I said, no. Now what just, do you want from yeah, me? <laughs> just, just that, yeah, I didn't want anything. I didn't want to borrow any books. I didn't want to borrow any sermons. But something about the don't wait for it to happen. Uh, there's a type of prayer uh, often referred to as a breath prayer. A prayer of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a breath prayer is different. It's It's like a... Not a spark, but just as soon as you think of it, yes, you mention it to God. Yes, I love that. There's a term for it, and I can't, I'm not thinking of it right now. But, I don't know the term, but, but I, I, I love that. And particularly when someone says, will you pray for me? Yes. Then as I'm walking away, yes. be praying right, right there. there. Uh, right there. I may forget it for a while. I heard a, heard a great question. Uh, this was posed um, the other day in a, in a Zoom call, which I know we're all tired of Zoom calls. But uh, a friend of mine, he asked all of us, what is giving you life right now? Mm-hmm. And he talked about uh, being able to talk to his grandson 
he had a, a sweet little grandson and 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 uh, they, they could talk on FaceTime and he said just that gives me such life it just it it brings me such joy so what is it for you Jim these days where we're a little bit isolated we're a little bit uh, not able to do maybe all that we've been been doing what is it for you that just breathes life into you oh it is once again that contact I think of how the granddaughters got to come over recently and spend the night with us, and that always brightens you. I think the young ones have a particular talent to just pick you up. They hardly know anything's wrong these days. Right. Uh, you know, that's something to say, because I was just uh, having a conversation with a friend at lunch and saying how kids have taken so much of this in stride, and, and they said, but the kids have, allowed to be, have been allowed to be kids again. They're playing more. Yes. They're they're not uh, bound by schedules and practices and all these things. And so they're they're having a kind of a resurgence of, of of a childhood instead of you know all of these schedules, which is great. Uh, what else gives you life? Um, it, it, what what else do you have? FaceTime. Yeah. Okay. Get on the phone with my uh, son in Midland and. Um, Sometimes we can't find the word goodbye. No <laughs> it goes on and on yeah. for an hour. Yeah. But but just sit and talk, and uh, the FaceTime puts it far more real than just a conversation on the telephone. Yeah. Um, I, I've we've we've found that if we can um, be alone with one of our kids driving down the road, mm -hmm. uh, taking in, taking one here, but that one on one time. The, they're not on a screen. We're not on a screen. Hello. Uh, I'm guilty of that too. But it, it, they subconsciously start to talk, and now they're not thinking about we're having a discussion. Right. Uh, it's a great time for some of the talks mm -hmm. that we talk about. That's a great time. If you can get them in a car, you're both looking out the windshield. You're not looking at each other. That is life-giving for me to I have find those also, times. I find also the assembly on Sunday morning. Yeah. It. I appreciate so much what you and the others have done to get us online. We need to be there already, I suppose. Yeah. And it's so valuable for the people who cannot come. But it's not the same. It, it, being with people, uh, listening to them sing next to you, as yeah. opposed to barely audible on a on a uh, recording. I, I, I saw a brother this morning. He came by to help us with the the coats, the giving out of the coats, and yes. they've not been able to come. And you talk about not being able to find a goodbye. <laughs> you know, we, because we hadn't seen each other. And we're talking and sharing and how's this and how's that. And uh, you just, it's a hard way to cut off. Kind of like right now. We have to cut off to go watch the video. So watch this video about about nefesh. I hope I'm saying that right. About uh, heart, soul. We're, ta we're talking about soul tonight. And let's see if we can uh, dig a little deeper when we come back. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the word soul. The Hebrew word is nefesh. It occurs over 700 times in the Old Testament. The common English translation of this word is soul, and that's kind of unfortunate. Here's why. The English word soul comes with lots of baggage from ancient Greek philosophy. It's the idea that the soul is a non-physical, immortal essence of a person that's contained or trapped in their body to be released at death. It's a ghost in the machine kind of idea. This notion is totally foreign to the Bible. It's not at all what nefesh means in biblical Hebrew. The most basic meaning of nefesh is throat. Like when the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, they're hungry and thirsty, and they say to God, we miss the cucumbers and melons we had in Egypt. Now our nefesh has dried up. Or when Joseph was hauled off into slavery in Egypt, his nefesh was put into iron shackles. But nefesh doesn't only mean throat. Since your whole life and body depend on what comes in and out of your throat, nefesh could also be used to refer to the whole person. Like in Genesis, there were 33 nefesh in Jacob's family, that is, 33 people. In the Torah, a murderer is called a nefesh slayer, and a kidnapper is called a nefesh thief. On the first pages of the Bible, both humans and animals are called a living nephesh. And if the life breath has left a human or animal, the nephesh remains. 
It's just called a dead nephesh, that is, a corpse. So, in the Bible, people don't have a nephesh. Rather, they are a nephesh, a living, breathing, physical being. Now, that might surprise you because most people assume the Bible says the soul is what survives apart from the body after death. And while the biblical authors do have a concept of people existing after death, waiting for their resurrection, they rarely talk about it. And when they do, they don't use the word nephesh. So even though nephesh is often translated as soul, the Hebrew word really refers to the whole human as a living physical organism. In fact, this is why biblical people can often use this word to refer to themselves. And gets translated me or I. Like in Psalm 119, most translations read, let me live that I may praise you. In Hebrew, the poet literally says, let my nephesh live that it may praise you. By using nephesh, the poet emphasizes that their entire being, their life and their body offer thanks to God. In the Song of Songs, the young woman constantly refers to her lover as the one my nephesh loves. And of course, love isn't just an intellectual experience, it's an emotion that activates your whole body, your entire nephesh. This helps us understand the brilliance of other biblical poets who could combine multiple meanings of nephesh in one place. Like in Psalm 42, we read, as the deer pants for the water, so my nephesh pants after you. My nephesh thirsts for the living God. So on a physical level, your throat can be thirsty, like a deer's, but then that physical thirst can become a metaphor for how your whole physical being longs to know and be known by your creator. Which brings us all the way back to the Shema. To love God with all of your nephesh means to devote your whole physical existence to your creator, the one who granted us these amazing bodies in the first place. It's about offering your entire being with all of its capabilities and limitations in the effort to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the Hebrew word for soul. Well, welcome back. I hope you enjoy that. I, these to me are just rich videos, even in their their brevity. I mean, it's a short four minutes, but there's a lot there. Yes. Uh, when when I hear a guy like Jim say, I knew that, but I didn't know this, uh, <laughs> that tells me that, that it's pretty good scholarship. And I've, I've found something new every week in these studies. I want to go back to this passage, Jim, and I, I want to, I want to read the whole thing, um, because they, they alluded to it, but I, I want us to kind of make this our, our basis for tonight's discussion as the deer. This is Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as, you pour out, as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. A deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why so downcast? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Well, let's make some connections here, Mr. Right. Jim. What What is this psalmist, or palmist, as some people have said, <laughs> uh, what is this psalmist saying here about his soul? I like particularly the emphasis in verse 4 for a little different take on the word soul. Uh, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. Uh, we, we've seen in the video that soul is the very essence of your being, the entirety of the person. And yet he talks about pouring out his soul. In this case, I think it is pouring out the, the desire, the very core of his being yes. calls out to the Lord. Yes. Well, this is a strange question. It's a good one for at home, but I'm going to pose this to you. When you locate your soul, when you think of it, where is it? <laughs> 
I always point to the heart, and I don't know why, because it's just the blood pump. Uh, now, the the, uh, the physical life is very much soul. Sure. In fact, animals have soul, and that is that breath of life. But it is their the essence of their being. It's it's hard to it's it's a bit like our discussion about heart, where for yes. for their culture, heart was what we would think of as brain. Um, and in our culture, that, that overlap gets there. That you have the ability to have a discussion in your own head with yourself. Yes. <laughs> We're getting a little bit metaphysical there. But the fact that, that we, you know, so maybe my soul is in my head, but I'm like you. I think of it as heart. And I guess what I got that was new out of the video, it's the entirety of the being. Right. The entirety of the being. And talking about the discussion with yourself, the psalmist keeps referring to himself asking, uh, why are you downcast? Yeah. Chet's business manager posted something this morning that I really like. Rather than telling people about how hard this year's been, tell them about how good God has been to you to get you through this year. I thought that was, I want to write about that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and he's going through something here. Uh, there, there's a circumstance where, I, I always call it a season of dryness. He's in a he's, he's in a drought. Desert. He's in a desert, and yet hunting him. Where is God? Where is your God? How come it's not going better for you? And I love it. it is. It's a conversation with himself, where he's acknowledging his brokenness. He's acknowledging the hurt, and it's almost like he's reminding himself, "No, I'm going to come back. Still, I'm going to praise." He's criticizing himself for being downcast. Talk about this because you and I, both our eyebrows went up when we read about I used to. I used to go to be with the Lord. Mm. Uh, and then something happened. Uh, these things I remember how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy. What happened? Did he stop going? Did the temple fall apart? Was he not able to get there because of enemies? What's going on there? There are two possibilities that come to mind. First, this could have been written during the days when Absalom had driven him out of the Absolutely. out of the country, and or to the other side of the Jordan at least, so that he could not go to the house of the Lord, and yeah. how that hurt. And then I think also of that period of time in David's life when he didn't choose to go. Yeah. And yes. And then he remembers how refreshing it was. Uh, you know, it's, we always say uh, that passage about at the time when kings went off to war, David was at the palace. Yeah. Uh, there's, it's not just that he's neglecting his kingly duties of going off to the battlefield. He is absent from the Lord. Absent from the Lord. Neglecting his spiritual Yes. Yeah. Okay, and, and this Bible project has made a just a masterful connection uh, when we've talked about heart, when we've talked about love, when we've talked about compassion, I'm trying to think of some of the other words with friends that we've studied, there's never a disconnect where it's just a feeling. Uh, we might say, some people might think that your soul is what's stirred within you. Uh, when you hear a great song, yes, uh, I'll be honest, patriotism for me is a soul stirring. We get stirred up by that. Um, uh, the holiday season stirs us up, right? But he says it's not just feeling, hearing, uh, hear, hearing Bing Crosby on the radio and feeling this warmth. There's a connection with doing. There's always a connection with uh, when he says what, what we like to do is go heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, mm -hmm. that must be four different entities. And so we're going to love the Lord our God. This is, this is, it makes for a great sermon series, yes. doesn't it? And we're going to do it in four different distinct ways. And we might say that strength is the actual going out and doing it. But in every one of those words, I think what we're going to find is it's, it's the all encompassing that we can't, we can't say that we love somebody and not serve. We can't feel compassion without actually going. Our, when we say we love the Lord your God with all of your heart, it's heart that's connected to do it. Is that? I remember Jesus saying it's difficult to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. And they're different Greek words, and I think there is a distinction, but trying to find the, the clean line right. is impossible. They overlap totally. Right. 
Uh, we have a tendency to talk about spiritual things aside from worldly things. <laughs> we have a tendency as church members to talk in the church with in the church with church people with a church language that we must talk about everything that's good and positive. There's a danger there. Yes. Because what I'm what I'm hearing from this nefesh is it's our whole life, the entirety. It's the good and the bad. It's that David can say, uh, in a dry and weary land where there is no water, my soul longs after you, God. Uh, so there's a there's an honesty, there's a vulnerability, maybe going back to vulnerability and empathy, um, that that is uh oh, it's just refreshing to to it's it's disarming. We're taking some of our armor down and we're saying I'm bringing it all. I'm bringing my worries about COVID. I'm bringing my worries about my job. I'm bringing about my worries about my kids. My uh, the, the things that that we've you know had that are great news. All of it is coming before the Lord. And I think when we separate one out, that we do damage to it. Yes. As well as to the yes. whole concept. Yes. Uh, I cannot. I cannot do justice to my relationship with my wife. If I try to just isolate that from our overall relationship or with people, with the Lord, uh, with our work. Well, but Jim, you and I have known each other long enough now to where if all you ever told me stories about you and Judy were all positive <laughs> and all loving, <clears throat> I wouldn't come to you for marriage advice. <laughs> but the other side is true too. If all you ever told me was, well, that Judy... Man, she just, you know, we just... It, Hard life. It, I wouldn't come to you for marriage advice. The person we want to hear from who goes, oh, yeah. It's real. It's real. Uh, these were the struggles. These were the joys. This is when we were just knocking it out of the park, doing great. And these are the times when we, we just were, were relying on other people. Um, that's the whole picture. That's a wholeness. I want to talk... One real quick, uh, I, I, want, I want to bring this up. It's a, it's a Mother Teresa story that I want to get to, and now my screen went dark. Uh, but we talk about when when people of great faith go through difficult times. I want to share this story, um, if I can get it to come up here. Um, not long after Mother Teresa passed away, a collection of her journals and letters were published. And those writings revealed a surprise to the Lord, to the world. When Mother Teresa began her work with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India, it was with a profound sense of God's call. At the age of 36, she heard God's call and experienced what she described as a profound sense of God's presence. But throughout most of her work in India, Mother Teresa experienced a deep loneliness mm. and longing and an overwhelming sense of absence of God. In 1979, when she received the Nobel Peace Prize, imagine this, she told those who gathered in her honor to honor her that the radiating joy is real and Christ is everywhere. Christ is in our hearts. Christ is in the poor we meet. Christ is in the smile we give and in the smile we receive. But just a few weeks later, imagine this, just a few weeks later, she had written to her spiritual director, Jesus has very special love for you. As for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and do not see, that I listen and do not hear. Wow. I love her candor, and I must say that I identify with that. There have been some times when I worked on a sermon and did not feel the presence of the Lord, did not feel a closeness to him. It was, uh, I suppose, almost mechanical. And I'm afraid that that was reflected then, so much so that the hearers knew. Uh, it's there's something surprising when you hear somebody that you think of as having such great faith, such great depth. In fact, when the I think when the world points to how Christians ought to behave, well, it's Mother Teresa. You go and you help the dead and the dying, and you're down in the you know the the slums with the poorest of the poor. And in that, to hear her say, "I looked for him and didn't see him. I listened and did not hear." That might be the best description of spiritual loneliness um, to, to ask God and not receive an answer, to ask God and not receive the answer that we want, to pray and feel like the prayers are hitting uh, the ceiling, to open the Bible 
and it just all feels a little stale. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it important, <laughs> Jim, for us to be honest about those times? Well, first of all, like I said a moment ago, we can pretend, but so often people listening to us know whether it's yeah. real or whether it is pretense. Yeah. <laughs> and then for ourselves, if I can be honest with me about where I am spiritually, then I know what to do. I, I can grow. I can get out of that. I can be where David was in Psalm 42. Why are you downcast? There's, there's no reason for this. Uh, and then I call to the Lord again. But if I'm going to be pretending with myself, uh, I can get pretty lost in a world that I don't want to be a part of. <laughs> and you can only pretend for so long. The, the, the seams begin to show. Yes. The the hollowness of those words begin to ring out. I was having a meeting yesterday with a, a group of preachers and our our coach, our mentor, he asked us, he said, ne- or he, he said, never underestimate uh, the importance of genuineness and a sincerity that even if you flop your sermon, that your audience is most likely going to pick on pick up on whether or not you were really sincere. Yes. And I couldn't help but think, sincerity, I bet that's something I could fake. You know? <laughs> like, but you can for a while. You, you can, can you can kind of pick yourself up and go, I'm gonna be bright and cheery and optimistic. I think there's something of much greater value to time for, for sometimes to hear I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time right now. I've looked and not seen. I've listened and not heard. Uh, that's that's a powerful word, powerful word. I and again, if I if I have a friend who is always bad news, I don't call him very much. Right. And if I have a friend who's always good news, I don't believe him very much. <laughs> you know that there is this. I, I guess I guess what we're taking from tonight is that there is a. An entirety. That's it. You That's know? it exactly. All of these different terms, soul, spirit, strength, heart, must overlap. And and, and you could almost use any one of them yeah. to express the entire thought. Well, let me give you a couple of questions here. Maybe something to discuss. I'm thinking about the kids who have now long gone asleep listening to us wax philosophical about, about the Lord. Um, what is it that brings them life? What is it that brings them great joy? I think that's a great question for kids. When are you most alive? When are you most happy? If you could describe the best day of your life, what would it look like? I think that's a good conversation starter. But then I think the second is important and is like it. Um, When you're having a really bad day, when things are really hard, who do you go to and what do you say? Uh, Because again, our, our following Christ, our relationships with each other are never all about one thing. I think about my relationship with my dad during my growing up years. I wanted to be with him. Yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes remember going to him and saying, I messed up. And he might say, well, tell me about it. And rather than fearing punishment or a lecture, you know, I almost always knew what he was going to say when I finished my story. He would say, well, what are you going to do differently next time? Yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do we learn from that? At, but, but the thought was, in bad times and good times, yeah. that closeness of relationship with a parent, yes. I think, is what the kids need. If, if, you, if you have someone uh, that when you have the best day of your life, they're the first person you want to call. Right. And they're the same person when you're having the worst day of your life. They're the first person you want to call. You found a great friend. You found a great partner. You found a great relationship. Right. Now move that on into the spiritual realm. Yeah, absolutely. And we ought to take all the problems to the Lord. And we generally do that. <laughs> I, I guarantee you the Lord's tired of hearing us go, well, could you do something about this? Well, how about all those great days? We ought to. That's good. Turn right back to thanks and praise because he's been so good to us. We hope this has been a refreshing night for you. I hope you've enjoyed watching this, uh, maybe with your family or with a small group. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us. God like bless it. you. We're, uh, we're, we'd we're be glad to see you on Sunday, but we'll see you again at uh, our next Words with Friends. <laughs>